have several stories to, to tell. Uh, first of all, when I wrote my, uh, my dissertation on Husserl's uh, analysis of intersubjectivity, I was really only working as a philosopher uh, I, and I had had no previous training in any other topic than philosophy. So I was working on Husserl and I was trying to show or demonstrate that, that Husserl's approach to intersubjectivity was uh, considerably more vibrant and uh, fruitful than many of the uh, Habermasians had, had argued. Now, shortly after I had uh, published my, my book on the topic, uh, I came across a book by a developmental psychologist called Daniel Stern. It's a book called uh, The Interpersonal World of the Infant. And it was such a, a discovery of me to to come across this book because what Stern was doing as a developmental psychologist was to a large extent to discuss many of the very same topics that I had been discussing as a philosopher. And I, I realized that at least when it comes to certain topics, philosophers have a lot to learn from other scientists and, and I also think that we as philosophers can teach those scientists something. So that was really my first encounter with a non-philosophical discipline that really caught my uh, attention. And then, uh, roughly at the same time, uh, I also uh, met up with a, a psychiatrist, uh, a colleague of mine that I have since collaborated with for, for many, many years, uh, called uh, Joseph Parnas, who really was defending and promoting and continuing the tradition of neurological psychiatry. And he was interested in dialogue and communication. And that was also a big kind of uh, discovery for me to suddenly realize that some of the uh, you know, analysis that I had undertaken uh, concerning the nature of self-consciousness, for instance, were actually analysis that could also have a, a practical impact that were of relevance for clinicians when dealing with uh, the uh, psychiatric patients. So suddenly it was like, you know, I, I had this discovery of, of, uh, of me being a philosopher, uh, suddenly having my, my world horizon to some extent enlarged. Uh, so these were both kind of personal encounters and the, and, the, and the last one, which perhaps is the one that is most well known, is that while all of this was happening. I had also spent time in Paris uh, uh, collaborating with uh, Nathalie Deprat and I had met uh, Francisco Varela and uh, Pierre Femmerge uh, and of course I, I then I uh, came to know uh, this whole uh, kind of Paris-based attempt at uh, linking phenomenology with cognitive science and I became involved in that uh, early work uh, and together with uh, Varela and uh, Sean Gallagher, I mean, we, we started discussing the possibilities of, uh, of you know, launching an association that should promote this collaboration, launching a journal that should promote it. So, so I, I mean, for I, think I always, I mean, I guess it's always, you know, there's a lot of contingency here, but I just happen to be, you know, intellectually. Uh, at a stage where I was very open to this kind of input uh, and, and also, you know, geographically I was in Paris right when some of these things were, were happening. So I was kind of caught up in it and uh, of course uh, a lot has happened since then uh, uh, and I guess um, to, to kind of come back to some of my own, uh, you know, more specific contributions to this field, uh, you know, whether or not a naturalization of phenomenology is a good thing, I think partly depends on what they mean by uh, that very term, because there are a number of different understandings that you can find in the, in the literature, mm -hmm. and so on. On one understanding, you know, naturalizing phenomenology basically means, you know, we, we presume and accept a certain, uh, you know, mainstream form of objectivism, you know, we have this idea that the natural sciences really have a certain primacy, a certain uh, uh, priority when it comes to uh, getting to the, the heart of matters or, or describing the world as it really is. Uh, and given their enterprise, uh, 
Uh, there is then a certain assumption that, well, if we also want to investigate consciousness scientifically, it might then be that phenomenology has certain resources that we can use. And so to nationalize phenomenology, given this specific understanding, basically means let's try to incorporate what phenomenology has to say about consciousness into a well-established kind of scientific framework. So that's one understanding of the term. Mm -hmm. And I have, an, I mean, I have numerous, numerous uh, reservations about this specific way of, of you know, uh, understanding and the naturalization of phenomenology, because I think that some of the most important insights that phenomenology have to offer partly has to do with a, with a reconsideration and a critical uh, assessment of some of these you know, metaphysical, scientific uh, commitment. So to, to just place phenomenology within that framework is also, I think, to some extent, to betray what phenomenology is really all about. Mm. But then there might be at least two other ways of understanding uh, uh, what a naturalized phenomenology amounts to. So on one understanding, and this is the one that I'm most uh, you know, comfortable uh, promoting, naturalized phenomenology basically just means Given our research focus, be it embodiment, into subjectivity, attention, temporality, uh, given that these topics are topics investigated by phenomenologists, well, you know, let's uh, let's not forget that these are also topics investigated by a lot of other people, including people, you know, working on these topics empirically. And my idea has then been just like I demonstrated a moment ago in the case of developmental psychology and in the case of psychiatry that, well, I think we can, as phenomenologists, we can learn something from the very careful uh, examinations that empirical scientists working on these topics have delivered. Uh, and likewise, we as, as philosophers can contribute with, you know, mythological reflections, conceptual tools, and can also aid them in their uh, investigation. So, Understanding naturalized phenomenology in this specific way is really, I think, a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the final uh, way of understanding, and I'll keep that brief, is, is, uh, is a, if you will, a more promissory uh, attempt at saying, well, let's go beyond just focusing on specific, you know, uh, concrete topics. Let's, let's think of the, na the naturalizing phenomenology the enterprise as a, as a much more ambitious rethinking of what natural science and you know nature actually means uh, so this is kind of taking it if you will a step further but i mean whether that is feasible and uh, i mean uh, is, is of course something that uh, people have very different views <laughs>
hostile uh, criticism that you can encounter is not really criticism coming from outside of phenomenology. It's kind of criticism that has you know erupted among different schools in phenomenology. So I think so. I mean, one of the messages that I have been pushing for quite a long time now is that I think that you know if, if we want to envisage uh, phenomenology having a future, I think it's uh, it's absolutely paramount that we do not waste all our intellectual energy in in infight. Rather, what we should try to do as phenomenologists is to try to articulate some of the kind of you know com commonalities that characterize different features in phenomenology. I think we should try to highlight those strengths, and we should try to bring those strengths into a dialogue with, with other contemporary ways of doing philosophy. So I think so again, when talk about defending phenomenology, I think this is very much what I have had in, in mind. So, so, uh, so I think if one if one if one kind of adopts a certain eagle's eye perspective on my work, uh, uh, my um, so my, my my PhD thesis one was on intersubjectivity, and my uh, habilitation, my kind of second doctoral degree was on on self consciousness, and I think. Ever since, or at least, I mean, at least since the mid '90s, I have constantly been working further back between these two main topics, you know, intersubjectivity, sociality on the one hand, uh, and uh, you know, self-consciousness, uh, selfhood uh, on the other. And then, at some point, uh, uh, I guess several things happened. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I. I um, I realized that, that these two topics, I mean, I guess that was not a new insight, but it also dawned on me that I had to bring those two topics closer together, uh, if you will. And one, one uh, t topic that uh, became central then was, was research and emotions, in particular social emotions, in particular the shame, that, I, that is the emotion that I've been working most on. And the reason why I got interested in shame was because because I thought that this interrelation or this intertwining between, on the one hand, self-experience, self-consciousness, selfhood, and on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, relationships to others, uh, that, that one of the areas where, where those, uh, that kind of dynamics is very clearly brought to light is precisely in our emotional life. And so I thought shame was a very good candidate for an emotion that actually could highlight to what extent a certain emotion that to a large extent is precisely about me, namely when I'm feeling ashamed, you know, my focus is really on, on me as a flawed being. But it's also, I think, an emotion that highlights very strongly the, the way in which I'm kind of embedded in or inserted into a social uh, setting. Uh, so, so that was a kind of one, one step, and the next step, which has been uh, something I've been working on for the last five, six years, has really been the topic of, of free intentionality. And again, I think if you kind of look at it, I mean, it seems like a very obvious, you know, step to make because I've been going further back between self and other, and then why not? I mean, take the step towards, if you will, a kind of enlarged self, a self that incorporates more than just one individual. Uh, so I've been very interested in uh, in we intentionality, in in we identity, collective identities uh, for for the last uh, years. And and interestingly, and this kind of comes back to something you you started out by saying. Uh, I don't really think that this is this is actually not breaking away from orthodox phenomenology because mm -hmm. my way of working <coughs> today is it's kind of still the way I've always been working in the sense I kind of I, you know I have this strategy of, of uh, kind of going back to the sources trying to see if there might be insights or distinctions or you know uh, philosophical ideas in the classical literature that can kind of be brought out and be brought in and be brought into a dialogue both with contemporary 
philosophers working on these topics, but also other empirical scientists who are working on such topics. And it is the case, and I mean, I will actually speak more about that later today, it is the case that many of the early phenomenologists, uh, roughly around uh, the First World War, all started to work on, uh, on collective intentionality, on re-identity, on communal experiences. So there's really a lot of, of, of uh, kind of very rich resources to be mm. found back back then. Mm. I think so, and, I, and again, I mean, I think it's kind of it shouldn't surprise us mm. that if you, as a phenomenologist, is interested again, you know, in intentionality, in, in experience, in subjectivity, and if you then also start to be interested in, you know, uh, empathy, uh, in social social forms of understanding, and then it's not surprising that, of course, you also come to to stumble upon something like, you know, communal experiences, uh, uh, you know, forms of identity that is not just tied to an individual, but to a group of people. So I think it's very, it's very natural. Uh, it, I mean, if there's something that is surprising, it's really that a lot of that material uh, has somewhat been forgotten until mm. quite recently. I think, uh, I think my, uh, my, uh, my extensive collaboration with with non-philosophers have kind of taught me to, or have given me the skill of kind of wearing two hats. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I'm, a, I'm very interested in transcendental phenomenology, uh, uh, but I also think that if you want to encourage uh, dialogue and communication and uh, you know exchange as a philosopher with non-philosophers, it might not be such a good idea immediately to start talking about transcendental philosophy. Yeah. So you need to be able to kind of <laughs> present, you know, the issues in such a way that they will precisely be, you know, accessible and, and relevant for for the non-philosophers. Mm -hmm. And again, I think I think we we kind of need to be in mind that you know that I really I really think transcendental philosophy is really something very specific, philosophical, and uh, it's kind of hard to see. If that's the, if that's what you're primarily interested in, I mean, it might be much harder to see, you know, how we could profit from, you know, discussing with sociologists, or developmental psychologists, or cognitive psychologists. So I think transcendental philosophy is not, you know, what is at, 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 the, at the forefront in those discussions. But of course, this doesn't mean that it's two completely different mm -hmm. enterprises. It's, it's more like, you know, what is the angle you are viewing? The topic under investigation with because if you're if you're interested in say you know empathy for instance of if you're interested in the nature of uh, interpersonal understanding well you can approach those topics both with a transcendental perspective and with a non-transcendental perspective and it's, it's not the concrete descriptions that kind of differ it's more the kind of systematic angle that you bring to be on those topics yeah, well, that's a <laughs> that's a big question, and I mean the way I'm kind of discussing it in the book. Uh, I mean the way I kind of set up my discussion in the book. I'm basically saying that I, I'm, I'm asking the following question: Would Husserl have been satisfied if the way his phenomenology were were kind of living on in, in contemporary discussions, if that was only in the form of you know specific investigations of empathy, embodiment, time consciousness, intentionality, etc. And I don't think so. I think for Husserl, what probably mattered most of all was this transcendental perspective. This is where he often claimed that uh, he often claimed that uh, that phenomenology was to some extent. Uh, realizing or fulfilling some of the you know motives that can be found in uh, you know in early modern philosophy and he really thought that this this uh, fulfillment or this combination even was precisely to be found in the shape of a of a transcendental uh, philosophy uh, so i think so I, so, I, so i definitely think that that was husserl's view uh, now then one might ask the question well but is is that is that also 
is that still the most relevant part of his philosophy? Uh, and I mean, what I'm trying to do in the book is to offer as as charitable uh, uh, an interpretation of, of this transcendental project, uh, um, uh, an interpretation that very much distances itself from certain other more classical interpretations that would often depict Husserl as a Cartesian, as a solipsist, as a kind of disembodied thinker. And I'm arguing, no, not at all. I mean, what Husserl's transcendental idealism is supposed to, to show is the extent to which subjectivity, intersubjectivity, and, and the world are all kind of, uh, you know, uh, related and how none of these uh, poles, if you will, can be understood uh, in separation from 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 one another. I, I think it's a very forceful, you know, view. I think, and I think this is particularly important. I think it's a view that really tries to do justice to and preserve a, a kind of commonsensical realism, a realism that says, you know, that we we I mean, the objects that we are perceiving, the objects that we are engaging with in in everyday life are are real. Uh, and I think that Husserl's, uh, again, this, I mean, for, I think from, for Kantian this might sound familiar. So I think Husserl would also argue that, that uh, not merely that transcendental idealism and empirical realism is compatible, mm -hmm. but also that the only way to really, you know, uh, uh, justify uh, the legitimacy of empirical realism is by endorsing a form of transcendental idealism. And, and the way I'm trying to show that in the book is by contrasting Husserl's view with the view of certain other supposedly realist types of philosophy, either speculative realism or a kind of neuro-representationalism, trying to argue that both of those positions, although they claim to be realist, actually uh, end up in views that very much questions whether the objects that we are surrounded by and the, and the world that we know from everyday life really uh, uh, is really real. Uh, so, so again, I think one way of perhaps trying to show the continuing uh, relevance of Husserl's philosophical project is to say, well, I mean, he's, he's, he's trying to offer us a, a way of preserving the kind of reality that we all that all that, that matters to us in contrast to a number of other competing philosophical perspectives. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Professor. Thank you. <laughs>